Good morning, church. Psalm 111 says, Hallelujah, I will praise the Lord with all my heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. The Lord's works are great, studied by all who delight in them. All that he does is splendid and majestic. His righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He has provided food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works by giving them the inheritance of the nations. The works of his hands are truth and justice. All his instructions are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever, enacted in truth and in what is right. He has sent redemption to his people. He has ordained his covenant forever. His name is holy and awe-inspiring. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his instructions have good insight. His praise endures forever. What to say, Lord, is you who give me life and I Welcome to Radcliffe United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us in worship today. If you would like to connect in with us or partner with us, we invite you to check out our Facebook page, our YouTube channel, or you can uh, find us on our website at www.radcliffeumc.org. Would you pray with me as we begin our time of worship? Lord, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the way that you continue to bless us each and every day. 
Lord, we pray for those who are hurting and those who are grieving, those who need your touch this morning. We pray that you bring us all together with you uh, in spirit as we join to worship you today. In Jesus' name, amen.
this morning. Lord, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your mercy that's new each morning. We pray that you would open our eyes, that we might see more of you working in and through and all around us. Lord, help us to, to see what you're doing, not just in our own lives, but in the lives of others around us as well. Lord, we confess that uh, there are times when we do see you at work. We do feel your touch or hear your gentle voice whispering to us. But instead of following you, we, we turn away and, and follow our own will instead. Lord, we're still sinners. We're still messes. And we're still in need of your forgiveness. Lord, forgive us for the way that we sin against you. Lord, we thank you that long before we did anything right, you sent Jesus into this world to live and teach and heal and serve and to suffer and die on that cross to become a way, not just make a way, to be, but to become a way to you. We thank you that your love didn't stop there on the cross. It didn't stay in the tomb. But three days later, by the power of your spirit, you raised him from the dead. And we know that today he's at your right hand side, interceding on our behalf praying the prayers and bringing them to your ears that we don't even know how to pray for ourselves and for those around us. Lord, we thank you for that. And we thank you that you did that long before we did anything right or took any steps toward you. And so it's in that spirit of gratitude and that spirit of freedom, Lord, that we come to you and we bring those burdens that are on our hearts for our friends and our family and our loved ones, and for all those whose lives touch our own. We pray for healing. We pray for comfort. We pray for peace. We pray for love and encouragement. We pray for your empowerment, Lord, and your provision. Lord, that you would help people, not just out of the messes, but to, to step up to be the disciples, to be the leaders, to be the people that you've created them to be. Lord, we pray that not just for others, but we pray that for ourselves. We pray that for our families, for our church, for our community. We pray that over the state of Kentucky and over our nation. Lord, we pray that over the entire world. Lord, we know that there are so many ways and so many places and so many people that really need you today. We lift them up and bring them to you. And leave them at your feet because we know that you know more about these situations. Lord, you're more able to act. And Lord, you love these people even more than we do. Even ourselves. You love us more than we love ourselves. And we thank you for that. But we know that our prayers don't stop there. And Lord, if there is a way that we can partner with you in being an answer to any of these prayers that are prayed, 
We pray that you would take us and show us how. We come in our first act of obedience today and pray that prayer that your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father.
come before you in prayer and we lift up our children. We lift up our teenagers. We lift up their families. Lord, we lift up teachers. We lift up our school bus drivers. We lift up those who are helping in the classroom and those who will be cleaning classrooms. Lord, we lift up the administrative staff of our schools, our principals, our secretaries. Lord, we, we lift up our school boards and we pray for your protection over all of them as we begin a new school year. We pray for your peace and your grace. We pray for your wisdom as they lead. We pray that you would help our, our children, our students find new ways to learn. And we pray that you would help them make new friends this semester as well. Help us to, to draw together and love one another the way you created us to. And help us not to miss an opportunity to share your love with one another. We lift this up in Jesus' name. Amen. Kids, today we're going to do something a little different. We're going to learn a Bible verse. And this is from the book of Ruth. Wherever you go, I go. Wherever you stay, I stay. Your God is our God. Let's do that again. Wherever you go, I go. Wherever you stay, I stay. Your God is our God. Bible story I'm going to talk about today is from the book of Ruth. And it is in a little town called Moab. Please excuse any pronunciations I'm wrong. But Naomi was married to Elimelech. And she had two sons, Malin and Kilad. Well, her husband passed away living here with her two sons. Well, the two sons, eventually, they got married. Uh, one wife was Orpah, the other wife was named Ruth. They lived happily together as a family for about 10 years. Well, eventually, the two sons passed away. So Naomi thought it was best that the daughter-in-laws move back in with their family. But Ruth says, no, I'm not going anywhere. Wherever you go, I go. Wherever you stay, I stay. Your God is our God. Well, Naomi was just so happy because she really loved Ruth. And Ruth had a great friend, not just a mother-in-law, but a great friend. So Ruth said, well, I'm going to go out to the fields. And I'm going to get us some grain. And Naomi goes, where are you going to go? And she said, I'm going to go out to the fields where they've already worked, and I'll walk along behind them and pick up the grain that they've left behind. So... Ruth grabbed her little basket and she went off and she found some people working out in the field with grain. And she just did like what she said. She was walking along behind them and picking up the grain that had fallen on the ground. And they, people working in the fields, noticed her and they smiled and said, you know, it was, it was okay with them that she did that. So she filled her basket up and she takes it back to Naomi. And Naomi was like, Oh, this is great. Where did you get this? And she said, well, uh, up the street here, there was a family, and they were working in the fields, and it was from, uh, the man's name was Boaz. Naomi said, Boaz is our relation. He is the keeper of the family. He oversees us all. And she goes, let's bless him. So they did. They prayed, and they blessed and the, uh, Boaz and the grain that they got for their meal. And see, this is how those commandments come around. Also, I talked about a couple of weeks ago. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And love thy neighbor as thyself. See, God put Ruth there to help Naomi. He knew later in life Naomi was going to need help. Because that's just what God does. He oversees us all. I thought that was a great story with a great lesson to learn. So let's end in prayer today. Thank you kids for listening. God bless them when they start off their school. And I love you guys. Bless you all. Amen. Would you join me in the Apostles Creed? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, 
The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Once in the time of the judges, when there was a famine in the land, a man from Bethlehem in Judah went with his wife and two sons to live in Moabite territory. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife was named Omi. His sons were Malon and Tirion. They were Ephraites from Bethlehem in Judah. They came to Moab and settled there. Elimech died, and Naomi was left a widow with her two sons. The sons married Moabite women, one of whom was called Orpha and the other Ruth. They had lived there about ten years when both Maon and Chilion died. Then Naomi, bereaved of her two sons as well as her husband, got ready to return to her own country with her daughters-in-law because she heard in Moab the Lord had shown his care for his people by giving them food. Accompanied by her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living, and they took the road leading back to Judah. Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, Go back, both of you, home to your own mothers. May the Lord keep faith with you, as you have kept faith with the dead and with me. And may he grant each of you the security of a home with a new husband. And she kissed them goodbye. They wept aloud and she said, no, we shall return with you to your people. But Naomi insisted, go back my daughters. Why should you come with me? Am I likely to bear any more sons to be husbands for you? Go back, my daughters, go, for I am too old to marry again. But if I could say that I had hope of a child, even if I were married tonight and were to bear sons, would you then wait until they grew up? Would you go on their account, remain unmarried? No, my daughters, for your sakes, I feel bitter that the Lord has inflicted such misfortune on me. As they wept still more, then Ophra, Orpha kissed her mother-in-law and took her leave, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her God. Go, follow her. Ruth answered, do not urge me to go back and desert you. Where you go, I shall go. Where you stay, I shall stay. Your people will be my people, and your God my God. When you die, I shall die, and, it, and there be buried. I solemnly declare before the Lord that nothing but death will part me from you. Then Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, and she said, No more. The two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem where their arrival set the whole town buzzing with excitement. The women cried, Can this be Naomi? Do not call me Naomi, she said. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has pronounced against me. The Almighty has brought me misfortune. This is how Naomi's daughter-in-law, Ruth the Moabite, returned with her from Moab. They arrived in Bethlehem just as the barley harvest was beginning. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the way that it speaks into our lives and shapes and changes us, works in and around and through us. Lord, we thank you for your spirit that so inspired that word and so faithfully carried it to us today and is here among us. 
right now. We pray by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would help us to receive your word and receive it well. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to share with you one of my favorite parables of Jesus. And it's a story about a father and two sons. No, it's not the prodigal son. That may be the one that you're familiar with. This one comes from Matthew chapter 21, verses 28 through 30. And this is the the paraphrase of that. It's very short. It just says that there was a father who had two sons. And he asked them both to go and work in his field. The first son said that he would. But then afterwards, he changes his mind and does not do it. The second son says that he's not going to go work in that field, but he also changes his mind and comes back and works that field after all. And Jesus asked the people that he told that parable to, uh, after telling them that, that short story there, he looked at the people and he said, which son was the obedient son? Jesus then said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. The kingdom of God is like this story, a father with two sons. Which son are you? In that parable. Today, we're going to hear another story, and this isn't a parable. This is from the history of the Hebrew people. Um, And instead of a story of a father and two sons, this is a story of a mother and two daughters, or two daughter in laws, uh, actually. There's some similarities and there's some differences uh, in between these two stories the parable and this story in Ruth of Naomi, the mother and her two daughter-in-laws, Ruth and Orpah. But I think both of these have a similar thread that go through them, a similar message that speaks out to us across the generations. And that's this. When you strive to be obedient to God, loving God and loving others becomes easier. Our story begins... Uh, in Israel, with one couple, a man named Elimelech and his wife Naomi. And there in Israel, during the time of, of Judges, uh, the land was going through a famine. It was really tough. And if you read through the book of Judges, you can see lots of different time periods uh, in that era that the country struggled. And Elimelech and Naomi got to the point where they were struggling enough that they said, it's not worth staying here anymore. Let's move out of the country to the neighboring uh, country of Moab because we think we may be able to find a better life there. And so they went and they took with them their two sons, Malon and Kilian. And they settled there in Moab. And after uh, Elimelech, the father died, the two sons, Malon and Kilian, married Uh, Some young ladies from there in Moab, they were called Moabites at that point. They married Orpah and Ruth. And they were there living together, Naomi and her two sons and their wives, together for about 10 years. But in that 10th year, both Malon and Kilian died, leaving those women alone. So after 10 years of living in this foreign country in Moabite culture, They may have left some of those Hebrew heritage things that they had behind. They were the foreigners living in a foreign country. And to be able to get in, they needed to to pick up some of those ways and be adopted in and accepted in to those uh, Moabite communities there. And marrying in was one of the most common ways of doing that. But I want to pick up here. uh, This is Ruth chapter 1, starting at verse 6. It says, Then Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had blessed his people in Judah by giving them good crops again. So Naomi and her daughters-in-law got ready to leave Moab to return to her homeland. With her two daughters, daughters-in-law, they set out from the place where she had been living, and they took the road that would lead them back to Judah. But on the way, Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, "'Go back to your mother's homes.'" And may the Lord reward you for your kindness to your husbands and to me. May the Lord bless you with the security of another marriage. And then she kissed them goodbye, and they all broke down and wept. No, they said, we want to go with you to your people. 
But Naomi replied, why should you go on with me? Can I still give birth to other sons who could grow up to be your husbands? No, my daughters, return to your parents' homes, for I am too old to marry again. And even if it were possible, and I were to get married tonight and bear sons, then what? Would you wait for them to grow up and refuse to marry someone else? No, of course not, my daughters. Things are far more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord himself has raised his fist against me. And again they wept together, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. But Ruth clung tightly to Naomi. Look, Naomi said to her, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. You should do the same. It's a point here where where they're expressing needs. And it's different. Uh, Again, contrasting back to that, that parable of the father with two sons, this is a different situation. And, And one of them is that men are different than women. Father and two sons are different from a mother and two daughters. Biological family is different from the families that you marry into. In-laws and outlaws, sometimes they're sometimes uh, called, but uh, they're different in the way that people express their needs. Some people are more open to expressing their needs than others are. While a father in the parable could ask his sons directly, hey, boys, I want you to go work this field for me. Naomi may not have been able to or may not have been comfortable asking for her daughters-in-law to help take care of her needs. But that need was real. We need to understand this, that this is not just people deciding to move to different places. The need here was real. Naomi, who is an older woman who has no one at this point, if her daughters-in-law leave her, she has no one. Uh, She's not even able to make the week-long trip back on foot, back to Judah, back to Bethlehem, where she might find other family, maybe a a niece or nephew who will take her in. She may not even make the trip. And that's that's even during peaceful times, just the the fact of wildlife coming in and attacking people, or the, the even greater dangers of starvation or dying of thirst out there in this wilderness. No, Naomi was not able to make that trip alone, which was probably part of why the two daughters-in-law started that journey with her. And this conversation is happening there on the road. Naomi's getting to a point where she's telling the girls, you need to go back because you're getting to that point following me, that point of no return, where you'll be trying to go back on your own and it won't be safe for you either. She's saying, don't worry about me. I'll take care of myself. But the reality is she can't take care of herself. And she knows it. And the girls know it. Even if that, Naomi's not able to say that out loud. Naomi tells them to go home to their mothers. Because they have lives left to live. That test of loyalty that they were having. Uh, in the midst of that, there was also a, a kind of act of obedience. And we see this in in several points in the the Old Testament where people who are not even Jewish, they're not Hebrew, they're not part of God's people who grew up knowing God, get a sort of little nudge, maybe from the Holy Spirit that tells them this is the way that you ought to go. And so there's a sense of obedience that comes in with that. And again, not always an obedience out of a sense of understanding it fully. But, but this obedience to uh, this, this is my best understanding of what the right thing to do is for people seeking to know God more in particular. And here, these uh, three women, Naomi and Orpah and Ruth, are all grieving. We, we need to, to understand that is the biggest context they're dealing with right now. There's no easy way out of grief and loss. And I think that's, that's an important piece to understand in the decisions that are made in this story. There are no easy decisions, and especially not in this this time of grief and loss. And there are consequences to whatever choices that you do make. There are going to be changes. And in fact, uh, in in the midst of this kind of grief and loss, there are changes that are going to happen, whether we want them to or not, whether we make a choice or not. Changes is going to happen. And there are consequences to that, that we're going to have to deal with one way or another. 
But w- what makes this story so powerful is not the grief and loss, but instead it's the love that's shared even in the midst of that very fresh grief and loss that's going on. Both daughters here are left with a choice, and no one is going to judge them for making one choice or the other. No one is going to judge them. They both share love with their words. They both walk part of the way down the road with Naomi. But one of the daughters shares her love with her choice that she makes. In verse 16, it says, But Ruth replied, Don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing more. So the two of them continued on their journey. When they came to Bethlehem, the entire town was excited by their arrival. Is it really Naomi? The women asked. Don't call me Naomi, she responded. Instead, call me Mara, for the Lord Almighty has made my life very bitter for me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me home empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has caused me to suffer and the Almighty has sent such tragedy upon me? So Naomi returned from Moab accompanied by her daughter-in-law Ruth, the young Moabite woman. They arrived in Bethlehem at late spring, at the beginning of the barley harvest. This is where the adventure of Naomi and Ruth really begins and starts to pick up. But this, this beginning part is crucial to the whole story. And it's one choice that happens. Ruth chooses Naomi. Ruth chooses Naomi. Why does she do that? Well, judging from her own words, God was not a big part of her life yet. She may have known a little bit about God, but as she makes this choice and and tells Naomi, don't tell me to turn back, she keeps saying, your God will be my God, will be, as in future tense, as is, is not now. I'm not a follower of your God yet, but I'm going to be. Your people will be my people. They're not my people yet. I know I'm going into a strange land to be a stranger there, to be a foreigner, where I'm going to have to learn the language and the customs and all of these different things, and I'm not going to fit in. But for your sake, because of what I have with you, because of what I see in you, even now at your lowest point, I will go with you, and I will adopt all of those things. And we don't know why she made this choice specifically. There's, there's uh, many possibilities. Maybe it was a last request from her husband as he lay dying. Would you take care of my mom for me? Maybe it was something she saw in Naomi. Maybe it was a particular kinship that she had with Naomi that she didn't find anywhere else. We don't know. We don't know. What we do know is that Ruth chose Naomi. And when she chose chose Naomi, she also chose God. Because she understood they go together. Naomi was probably not the most devout Jewish person. If so, she wouldn't have moved to Moab. And she certainly wouldn't have allowed her sons to marry Moabite women in that situation. That would have gone against a lot of the Jewish customs back then. So we know that Naomi was not a perfect person, but there was something, there was something good that Ruth saw in Naomi that was enough for her to see a little bit of God and for her to choose both together. And so think about this in terms of, of, as we understand what it is to be a disciple and what it is to make disciples, our, our, our mission, our purpose of being a church to to make people who make disciples, who make more disciples, who make more disciples. And the connection that we have in here, in this wild plot twist that we have between Ruth and Orpah and Naomi, you have the new disciple, the, the one who doesn't know God well enough yet, that new disciple who's stepping up to protect, to save, 
and eventually redeem the one who's there as the disciple maker. It's got it sort of got the, the, the thing all flipped around backwards. Normally we think of the disciple maker as the one who pours in and, and works to save and redeem and invest into the new disciple, but it's flipped around backwards here. Ruth, the disciple, is the one who's stepping up, making those choices, taking those big steps to help the disciple maker, Naomi. Many of you have already done this. You've been in situations where, where you've had to uh, step out, step out of your comfort zone and follow somebody else to a new place where you had to learn new customs and new ways of doing things and you were stepping out on faith. That's not foreign to, to a lot of us in our community. But let me ask you this. Are the person, the, the people that you've stepped out to follow in that, are they your disciple maker? Or consider the other angle. You know, sometimes God gives us freebies. Sometimes he drops people right into our path, right at our doorstep, right in front of us. And they say all the right words. They come to us and they say, I see God in you and I want to be a disciple. I want to be a follower of Jesus. Will you help me? Sometimes God aligns the stars just perfectly to do that for us and sends us freebies. If you were in need and in grief and hurting and someone came to you and said that, and they said even more than that, that they'll go wherever you go, that they'll do whatever you ask them to do, that your God would be their God, what would you give them in return? How would you shape that person into a disciple of Jesus? You know, God gives us these kind of opportunities, and sometimes we call them persons of peace, people that, that we just connect with. Sometimes they literally come across our path, and there are other times that God sends us to them. But there are these opportunities that God sends to us that just make loving that person and showing them the love of God just easy. But it becomes easy out of obedience because they don't always come during peaceful times in our life. They don't always come when we're ready, when we're prepared, when we're, we're thinking, yep, I'm, I'm good to go, Lord. You can send one, anyone in the next five minutes would be perfect. It doesn't always happen in our time. In fact, most of the time it doesn't happen in our time. It happens in God's timing. And sometimes they're not in necessarily the best of times for us. Sometimes they come during our darkest days when we feel the farthest from God. And sometimes God sends us a young disciple like that or a young ready to become a disciple just specifically to remind us of who we are in Christ as a disciple maker, to remind us of our role and to give us that encouragement of what God is asking us to do and what our purpose is here. Sometimes we are that young disciple that's being sent out to, to reach out to some of those who've gone before us or those who, who maybe have a little bit of maturity in the faith and have just gotten themselves in a, a place where they're just feeling lost, lost a sense of purpose, lost a clarity of their role, or change happened, and they, they weren't able to, to bounce back from that as easy. Sometimes we are that young disciple that's being sent out to bring the love of God to them. Not to disciple them, but to be discipled by them. Either way, it comes down to obedience. And that obedience comes from loving God and loving others. And this is a way, this discipleship, this relationship that we have with one another, sharing that love of God and sharing that God, God's love that he has in and through us to one another. And that, that passing back and forth, that phrase that Ruth gives us, that where you go, I will go. Your God will be my God. 
your people will be my people. And that, that sort of DNA of discipleship is what he designed us to be as the church. Those that come together and form a new kind of family. Not just a new family, but a new kind of family. To do something that you don't get with your biological family. That you don't get with your married in family. That you don't necessarily get with an adopted in family. But you do get in God's family. That sense of purpose that sense of belonging, that particular role, that reason to be, it comes down to that obedience to God at that very base core. And that's where I think it does connect with the story of the father and the two sons, because we all have these opportunities, not just once in our life, but multiple times. We have these opportunities where God is asking us to go and do something, to go and be with someone, to go and love someone with not just our own love, but with his love in ways that are often bigger than ourselves and require us to step out of our comfort and into places that we know we can't go by ourselves. And we have to trust God. And we have to trust those around us that he's sending us to and that he's sending us with. That's where I think the, the story of the two sons and the two daughters come together in that sense of obedience. So I ask you, brothers and sisters, who in your life needs that encouragement? Who is the person that, that God is calling you to be the, that Naomi for and setting that example of loving God and loving others and showing them God in a new way? And who... Who do you need to be a Ruth to? Who is out there that you've seen God working through their lives? And God is asking you today to be a Ruth to that person, to come alongside them and to give them that encouragement and that reminder of who they are as a disciple maker. Would you pray with me? Lord, we know you have the whole world in your hands that you created us with your words and with your actions, and that you've continued to shape this world since day one. Lord, we know you didn't just kick it off and then sit back and watch all the chaos and the mess that happens, but you continually plunge your hands in through the power of your spirit. And we know that you did it so dramatically in the work of Jesus Christ. Lord, we know you are active and alive and working with us today. And that all the details of our life, including the relationships we have with one another, our friends, our family, our neighbors, with strangers, Lord, with our enemies, all of these people, you have plans and purpose for. Lord, we know on some level that we just need to ask you. Ask for your leading, for your guidance and direction. Lord, help us as we hear your voice and as we, we come to understand, maybe not the whole picture, but those, those, those handles, those next steps that we have in all of our relationships, how to be obedient to you. Because we know that if, if we focus on being obedient to you, you'll take care of the rest of the details. And it may not make loving you and loving others easy all the time. But we know it will make it easier than us trying to do it on our own. Help us, Lord, to follow you. To give you that burden. And to take on your burden of just being obedient to what you call us to. And who you call us to. And how to love them and to love you. We lift this up in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
protect you. May the Lord's face radiate with joy because of you. May he be gracious to you, show you his favor, and give you his